Today on Monkey Life, a Gibbon family is released back into the wild at the park's sister sanctuary in Vietnam. The whole family together, little baby on board, reaching out and grabbing its own bits and pieces. Only day one, but good first day. But despite months of careful planning, in a matter of days, the team lose track of the family. From that point onwards, I think that was the last time they were seen was when I was there. We never saw them again. And back at the park, Queen of Bubbles, Arme, doesn't share, even with big boss Tuan. Monkey World in Dorset, buried deep in the English countryside, is the largest sanctuary of its kind on the planet. The team, led by Dr. Alison Cronin, rescue and rehabilitate abused and unwanted primates from all over the world. I can't keep her in, get her in. Okay, got it. The park provides a home for more than 260 monkeys and apes from 24 different species. The world may be on pause, coping with the COVID-19 pandemic, but life carries on at Monkey World and its sister sanctuary in Vietnam. Dao Tien is an island reserve, lying within Cat Tien National Park in the Dong Nai province, 160 miles northeast of Ho Chi Minh City. Set up 12 years ago with the full support of the Vietnamese authorities, it was the brainchild of Monkey World's director, Dr. Alison Cronin, and her late husband, Jim. The center is now run by Dr. Marina Kenyon and her partner, Lee, with the help of a dedicated Vietnamese team. The coronavirus has just rocked the world, and it's no different even out in the middle of the forest in Cat Tien National Park. So Marina and Lee are trying to protect their primate care staff, our family on Dao Tien, both animals and, you know, all of the people who work there and look after our primates. So it, it, it's just really strange because um, since Dao Tien's inception, all of those years ago, more than 10 years ago, I've always gone out there every year. It's sort of like my second home um, and usually a couple of times per year. So it seems odd that right now I've, I can't do that. Set in 56 hectares of lush native forest, the center aims to rescue and rehabilitate endangered Vietnamese primates from Southeast Asia and ultimately release them back into the wild. The team have enjoyed huge success with pygmy lorises. 88 have made it back into the trees so far. They've had more limited success with langurs and golden cheek gibbons. Unable to make one of her regular visits, today Alison is catching up with Marina via a video call. Well, I wish I could come out and see you guys again, but um, it doesn't look like that's gonna happen for until next year, I don't think. Yeah, things are changing fast out here. I think we're gonna get used to the fact they've got COVID and then maybe relax a little. Oh. Yeah, it really means, I mean, the world is a different and dangerous place, but it just sort of puts everything on hold, everybody's world on hold, I suppose. Yes, I know. Um, <laughs> and are they allowing everybody at Dao Tian to um, continue working as usual, or...? You have to wear a mask, um, but no, everyone's been fine. Okay. Life may be far from normal at Dao Tian, but sadly, that hasn't stopped the influx of primates needing rescue and rehabilitation. Since 2008, the center has received 17 Duke Langers in need of care. But recently, the number of infants arriving has increased dramatically. The team now have five youngsters to look after. We have Do, Anna, Vu, Lum, and Anthony. It hasn't been an easy 
going few months for Liam Marina because recently there's just been this huge increase in infants being confiscated and brought to us. So you're torn. Um, I am very happy that all of those baby dukes are in Liam Marina's care and that the team on Dao Tien have come a long way in knowing how to look after them and for all of the bumps in the road that you're going to encounter in terms of their behavior, their emotional stability, and mainly their digestion, which is really tough to handle and look after. So hats off to them. They're doing a really good job and under difficult circumstances. Alison's most recent visit to Dao Tien was last year, during the rainy season. She went to help Marina and the team release a family of gibbons back into the wild. They were Limwen, his mate Misu, and their three children. They were transported to a release site at La Na, part of Kat Tien National Park. The journey wasn't easy. The team had to travel over land and by boat and then on foot through lush native forest. It wasn't the first time Lim Wen and Misu had been released. Five years ago, the pair, then just young adults, were let out in a different part of the rainforest. Unfortunately, Misu spotted a wild male and took off after him, while Lim Wen panicked, became frightened, and headed to the ground. The pair had to be caught and taken back to Dao Tien. Five years on, with the family bigger, stronger, and more mature, it was time for a second attempt at release, this time to an area with no other gibbons, apart from a female called Bin released by the team earlier in the year. The team hoped Savvy, Lim Wen and Misu's eldest son, would find her and pair bond. I've come back out to uh, see Bin. She's about two kilometers away in the forest and actually doing really well. She's lost a bit of weight, but that's to be expected. And now we're bringing Lim Wen and Misu's family. There are five of them all together. We've gotten radio callers on three of them, on Limwin, Misu, and then their eldest son, Savi. Um, and we're about to take them out into the forest to their release site, which isn't too far away from Bin. So we're hoping the eldest son, Savi, communicates with Bin and that they might actually pair up in the end. So it's a really exciting time getting goosebumps because this is like a big, vulnerable family group that we're now taking out into this new area to repopulate with gibbons. So fingers crossed everything goes okay. They've made it this far so far. It was a four kilometer trek through thick forest to the release site, carrying heavy cages along a saturated track. The going was tough, but eventually the team arrived at their destination an area of forest perfect for a gibbon release, with tall fruiting trees and dense canopy. The team wasted no time getting the family into a temporary cage, where they spent the night together getting used to the sights and sounds of the forest, before being released the next day. We've just got them here now and all really calm. They're just hungry and the two adults are just spending their time looking into the trees saying, and yes, can we go now? Um, but it's all looking really good. But Limwin in particular is pumped up. He's an adult male now, ready to go. Early the following morning, the family were quietly released. And later, Alison, Marina and the team went back to the site to check on them. We've managed to find Limwin and Misu and their family not far from the release site, but we've got fruit up in a supply basket for them. Not interested. We've tracked them down, not sure even how many meters away from the release site, but to a wild fruit tree. They're eating leaves, eating fruit. Whole family together, little baby on board, reaching out and grabbing its own bits and pieces. This is the start of repopulating this whole area. It's just fantastic. So only day one, but good first day. 
48 hours later, Alison headed home. But in the days that followed, concern grew. They looked rock solid, so I left Vietnam at that point in time feeling very confident that Lim Nguyen, Misu and their family were strong and that they were in the vicinity of Bin, who was also still doing really well. Um, and then from that point onwards, I think that was the last time they were seen was when I was there. We never saw them again. The situation went from bad to worse when, a few weeks later, female Bin had to be recaptured. She had approached local fruit farmers, leaving the safety of the tree canopy for the ground, possibly looking for food. This made her a target for poachers. It was a big blow for the team. Since then, Marina has spent countless days in the forest, searching in vain for a sighting of the Gibbon family. Although unable to track them down, she recently heard Gibbons calling. You're thinking that Limwin might still be out there? I think Limwin's still out there. Yeah. Mr. Bin thinks Miss Limwin is still out there. Whether with full family, we don't know. When we were searching, I was always drawn to this one plot of forest, which is beautiful, where I could smell Gibbon feces. <laughs> and, um, and that's also where we've been hearing the calls from. OK. It's beautiful, it's lovely given habitat. They could quite happily stay there and be quiet. Alison isn't sure. I believe that they're probably still out there or tragically, maybe she's been hunted and the group fragmented. We'll march on regardless. That's a lesson that we've learned over and over again here. And it's the same for them in Vietnam. But I'm hopeful. It's cautiously hopeful. Marina and her team will monitor the area for evidence of the released Gibbon family when they can. And they'll continue their work to rescue and rehabilitate endangered Vietnamese primates in the hope of future successful releases into the forest. It's the start of what promises to be a very hot day at the park. With temperatures set to soar, the primate care staff are aware how important it is to keep their charges cool and hydrated. At Tuan's orangutan enclosure, Jano and James are taking the opportunity to put out breakfast before the sun gets too high in the sky. They want to make the group of five work for their meal while temperatures are cooler. And there's a fun treat in store too. Straight away, when they come out, we're going to make them working hard to get their breakfast so they have to climbing around. And then, after they've been working really, really hard, we literally provide some uh, lots of pockets, fill up with lots of bubbles as well, so they can chill out playing with bubbles. So that is, I think, a uh, sort of good deal. So work hard and then chilling out with bubbles, so perfect for them. Breakfast is being served high up on the climbing frame and in puzzle feeders all over the enclosure. Look at that. If they don't do climb up, get high, all the time, of course, they're just getting lazy and their muscles starting getting weak and they just eat too much and they're just getting so fat. So, yeah, what we try to do is uh, try to get them as high as possible pretty much every day. The enrichment will give the group a full-on early morning workout. Atwan is first out of the blocks, sprinting across to the climbing frame. She ignores the bubbles in the tub for now, opting instead for some nice cool yogurt that's been smeared over the hosing. Roro, with Hu Zhan glued to her back, checks out a bucket of bubbles on the ground, with the youngster paying careful attention. He's always learning from the adults, but today, Roro decides it's far too hot to be carrying him around and tries to offload her passenger. Eventually, Hu Zhan gets the message. He's confident enough, and more than capable of heading off and finding his own breakfast. Free from the burden of carrying her surrogate son, Roro heads up to join Awan, 
where there's a whole lot of fresh browse to enjoy. The enrichment is having a positive effect on everyone. Normally, sedate leader Tuan is off the ground. But he can't seem to make his mind up what to try next. While most of the group tuck into breakfast, Ame has her eyes firmly fixed on the bubbles. Ame is the queen of the bubbles. That's why we provide as many as tap track possible. Once we only did once uh, tap track, literally Ame not uh, letting somebody else to play with it. She loves bubbles. She even dunk her face on the inside the tap track as well. <laughs> But she's not the only one. Awan's enjoying a good wash. Bubble Queen Ame doesn't share. No one's getting their hands on her tub. Not even dominant male Tuan. As for Hu Jan, he's making the most of being independent. For such a small chap, he's a brilliant climber. But gathering in the food once you've reached it isn't so easy when you're small. And other more mature and experienced orangutans know climbing isn't always necessary. If less skilled housemates are kind enough to drop it down from up high. And when it's such a hot day, what better way to cool down than a quick dip in the bubbles? Tuan's group of orangutans aren't the only ones being kept cool today. At the Gibbon Complex, Jake and Zoe, two of the park's golden-cheeked gibbons, are being given an icy treat. Their daily portion of fruit has been frozen in a low-calorie juice to form lollies. But to get their fruity lunch, the pair will have to make an effort, digging the fruit out of the ice. They don't waste any time and attack the ice lollies with relish. At 33, Zoe is the older of the two, by eight years. She arrived at the park from Ping Tung Rescue Center in Taiwan. Jake came to Monkey World in 2004 from Los Angeles Zoo to be paired with Zoe. The pair bonded well and have successfully raised two offspring, Kim and Zach, who now live with partners of their own. The frozen lollies prove no obstacle. The gibbon's huge canine teeth are perfect for breaking through the ice. Gibbons are lesser apes, and like all the great ape species, they don't have tails. They use their long arms to dangle in the tree canopy and swing through the branches and can travel at speed. Unlike the great apes, gibbons generally form long-term pair bonds and Jake and Zoe are a perfect example. But the couple have contrasting characters. As a pair, they are completely different in personalities. Uh, Jake, most people can say he's probably got a split personality. To some people, he's really, really loving, kind, gentle boy. Whereas to others, he always likes to crash around the enclosure, sh show how masculine he is. Whereas Zoe, she's completely different. Uh, she's always keeps to her herself. She'll often completely ignore everyone. She doesn't crave us humans, uh, which is lovely to see. Um, but then she also does have a really sweet side. So in the late afternoons, you often see them sat together grooming, which is really nice. They're a happy and contented pair, and testament to the work and dedication of the care team who look after this endangered species. At the Loris Complex, the housemates are about to be given their breakfast outside. The new enclosure has been specially designed for these nocturnal primates. It has native planting and insects mimicking nighttime conditions and a natural setting they can enjoy. Today, the lorises have been given freshly harvested local maize, corn still in the husk. They're not particularly tough, you know, it has got quite a, a tough outside, 
but um, Loris aren't like some of the uh, larger, more evolved apes that could work it out and work out how to peel it like you might see the chimps or even the capuchins doing. So they'll just go at it like a bull in a china shop and use their incisors to actually gouge through that husk um, without thinking to pull it and peel it back. They'll just gouge through it and just to get to the yellow inside. One Loris who loves his new enclosure, particularly when food is involved, is Axel. These little primates aren't the fastest of movers, but this morning he's left his housemates behind to get a head start and make the most of the tasty corn. He's barreled out into his outside enclosure after smelling the corn and has attacked it pretty much and uh, ripped it to shreds with his really strong teeth, which is excellent because in the wild Loris gouge tree bark to get at the sap and the exudates that come from the trees. And in captivity, that's quite hard to replicate. We don't have the same species that, of trees and things that they'd eat in the wild, so anything that we can give them to make them gouge and get to the sweeter inner core of whatever food item it is, then the better for their dentition and their tooth health. Lorises are incredibly flexible, using their vice-like grip on branches to hang and twist to reach food before engaging their sharp teeth. Axel is in his element. The problem for the team is he likes his food in the enclosure so much that when it's time for bed, he doesn't want to leave. But Nick has come up with a solution. We have been doing recall training with the Loris, so um, when we do opera conditioning, if we give them a food item such as nectar or, or gum through a syringe, um, that we ring up a, a small little set of jingle bells at the same time so that when they hear those bells, they know to come through the tunnel or, or into another room, expecting the food item that they favour. Axel Rose. But getting him back inside with the whole corn on the cob out there might prove to be a bit more tricky. Um, but we'll see how we go. And there's no problem with him hanging around outside on a nice day like today. But Axel demonstrates even a Bengal slow loris can speed up when there's a treat to be had. Next time on Monkey Life. Jeremy turns inventor to encourage his old friend, orangutan Amy, off the ground. Come on, Amy, get up there. But he gets the brush off. Don't give me that look. I divorced you a long time ago. And woolly monkey Pichua takes her time deciding if she wants to be friends with impressive male Levar. 